God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. In love, He predestinated us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Lord, him and through Him and to Him are all things. I messed up on predestinating. I can't get that out of my head, so that's why I It should be predestined. Sorry. Okay, let's keep going. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. For from him and through him and to him are all things. In him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. For from him and through him and to him are all things. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth in the, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ.
microphone is working. Wow, great songs. Jan, nice job selecting that stuff. That was just so, so great. Thanks to the Lord. Thanks to the Lord. Amen. Uh, we are in week three in our series on the Sermons on the Mount. And in week two in a little sub-series here on the Beatitudes. Last week we were discussing five Beatitudes of internal piety. We were focusing on internal qualities. Um, the, the citizen of God's kingdom focuses on their inward qualities, whereas the scribes and the Pharisees focused on the outward. Uh, an appearance of religiosity rather than a true heart relationship with the Lord. Today we're going to talk about two Beatitudes of spiritual reciprocity. And next week we'll talk about two Beatitudes having to do with persecution. And that will get us through the Beatitudes. Before we do that, let's pray together. Father, we come and, and we quiet our hearts before you. There are some here who who come with heavy hearts. There are things on their hearts and on their minds that are burdensome. There are physical problems with illnesses. There are relational issues that we all have to deal with. There may be uncertainty about the future, with jobs. So many things can preoccupy our thoughts. And we want to focus in on you right now. We want to hear from you. We want you to have our totally undivided attention. We want to join with Samuel, who said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We ask that you do speak, not just to our minds, but to our hearts. We want to glorify you with our lives. Please do that in us right now. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our King. Amen. Well, today, what a big fancy word, spiritual reciprocity. You are probably familiar with this principle, although you may not have been able to identify it by that title. And that's a little bit hard to read, isn't it, in orange? Can you, can you see that? Can you make that out? <clears throat> Trying to decide what colors work well on our PowerPoint here. But spiritual reciprocity is simply this. God expects his redeemed children to extend to others the same blessings that we ourselves personally have received from him. It involves receiving blessings in our divine vertical relationship with him and then reciprocally offering the same to others in our human horizontal relationships. Now this is nothing new. We, we, we understand this. We, we focus on our vertical relationship with him and then we focus on our horizontal relationships with others. Um, very similar to what we hear in the Great Commandment. You know the Great Commandment. What is the Great Commandment? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you want to include all of it. And what's the second? To love our neighbors ourselves, right? So the first one focuses on the vertical relationship. The second one focuses on our horizontal relationships. Now, here's the thing. We have received blessings from the Lord in our life. And he expects us to be a conduit to share those blessings with others. Blessings such as love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and peace and comfort. Not to hoard them, but to share them with others. In fact, it's a sign of kingdom citizens to pass this along to others. If we truly appreciate the blessings that God has done for us, we are going to pass those on to others. Nothing new. Nothing new. <laughs> Let's play a little game called fill in the blank. I'll start a Bible verse and you finish it. 
We love because He first loved us. There you go, because He first loved us. We have a capacity to love. We understand love because He first loved us. And if we are truly changed by His love, it should flow from us to other people. Amen? It should. This is what is normal. This is the normal Christian life. This is the normal life of a citizen of God's kingdom, of a disciple of Jesus Christ. We will be like him. He was a lover. We are to be lovers. So we're not to hoard it. We're to appreciate it and to pass it on. Let's look at a few examples of this. Love. In John 13, 34 and 35. Will you read that? Let's just read some of this together. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Now, it's not a new commandment to love one another, but it is to love one another as Christ has loved us. Here's one on forgiveness. Let's read it from Colossians 3.13. Bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And grace from Colossians 4.6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Those are just three examples. So we have received love. We have received forgiveness. We have received grace. We're to pass it on. Pay it forward if you want to call it that. But if we really have received these things, and if we truly appreciate them, we should pass them on. Now, a wonderful example of this is found in the parable of the unforgiving servant. The unforgiving servant was relieved a huge debt that he could never repay. And what does he do? He goes to somebody who owes him a little, and he says, pay me what you owe me. And God is very upset with that person because they're, they just received a huge forgiveness of debt and yet, it hasn't affected their heart. They're extracting from somebody something that's owed them. Please be patient with me. You know, the, the, the second servant says, please be patient. And the person is not patient. Now, if we truly want to get a hold of this principle of spiritual reciprocity, we need to, to do three things. First of all, we need to understand the need for and the result of God's blessings in our life. And quite honestly, there are so many other things to think about that we don't think about this that much, do we? If we would take time and really think deeply about what God has given us, the blessings that he's extended us, and, and the need that we really have for these things, it's going to change us. So that's the first thing. And that affects our vertical relationship. Secondly, there needs to be heartfelt gratitude and appreciation for God's blessings. Are we flippant? Are we flippant the fact that God has extended love to us? Where would we be if God had not extended his love to us? None of us would be in this room. None of us would have these relationships. None of us would have any hope of ever being right with God. But he was the first mover. And we're expected to pass that along. And then there should be gratitude-driven, spirit-empowered contribution to others. And there is the horizontal aspect. All right? So if we're truly changed, if we truly appreciate this, it is going to affect our horizontal relationships. That's what these two Beatitudes today are talking about. So you need to understand the background. Now, last week, for those of you that were not here, what we were talking about was the word blessed, makarioi, actually means this, divinely joyful, perfectly happy, fortunate, inwardly satisfied, not dependent on outward circumstances for happiness. That's what it means when he said, blessed are, and then he goes on. If we are pursuing these character traits within us, we are truly living a life that is blessed. 
and there is reward that comes to us. And we're going to talk about those today. So let's move on and talk about today. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now to define this, we need to understand what it means to be merciful. Just take the English word, merciful. It means you're full of mercy. It's not, I'm just extending mercy this one time, but I am full of mercy. I have such gratitude for the mercy that's been extended to me that I'm going to be merciful as a person to other people, just as God is merciful to me on a continuous basis. It means to feel sympathy with the misery of others, to be touched. It's when somebody goes, oh, they're identifying with that person, oh, or as we say here in the South, bless your heart. <laughs> now here in the South, that means you're so stupid. <laughs> bless your heart. You don't know any better. But it really means bless your heart. You know, I'm extending mercy to you. Oh, that's horrible. I'm identifying with your pain. But it also means to show pity, especially when it's undeserved. When someone has wronged you, and rightly you, you could punish them, but you don't punish them. All right? The converse of what this means, what it does not mean is, you're not cruel, you're not harsh, you're not hard, you're not uncompassionate. All right? So we understand what it is, we understand what it isn't. And the promise is, is that people in God's kingdom, who are merciful shall receive mercy. It stops there. Who do they receive mercy from? What's implied is from God. God will continue to pour out his mercy on us. If our relationship with him is right, and our relationship with others by extension is right, he is going to continue to bless our hearts when we continue to need mercy, he will continue to heap that upon us. Now, when we hear this term mercy, many times you hear it coupled with another word, grace. Mercy and grace. What's the difference between mercy and grace? I'm so glad you asked that question. Because I have a slide for that. I tried this week to come up with the best way of understanding this and explaining it to, to you what this means, and I hope this captures it. Mercy is showing compassion and extending forgiveness when it's in your power to punish instead. Mercy is that. Grace is that. Plus, it's bestowing additional favor when it's in your power to punish instead. Let me illustrate. Let's assume for a moment that someone has cheated you out of a huge amount of money, maybe your life savings. You've invested it and, and you were cheated. So it goes to court and the, uh, the judge determines, yes, that person definitely has cheated you. They are guilty and they're going to be punished. So justice is going to be served. And then in the sentencing part of that trial, you appear as a witness for the accused. And you say, Your Honor, I forgive this person. I just want you to know that I forgive them for what they've done. And I'm asking you, to be merciful to them in your sentencing. Please take into consideration this or that. Okay, that's an example of, of me who's been wronged showing mercy to the person who's wronged me by forgiving them of what they've done and asking that they receive mercy. But here's where grace goes a step further. It does that, and then it says, Your Honor, if there's any fine, if there's any jail time, I'm asking you to allow me to serve that or pay that for them. 
That's unusual, isn't it? That's, that's not normal. That's not natural. But it's divine. You see? If somebody wrongs you, yes, you are right in sticking it to them. Somebody slanders you, you have a right to slander them back, but you don't do it. You give them mercy instead. And then, in addition to mercy, you say, not only do I forgive you, but I want to take you out to lunch. Wow. That's a step beyond. And that's the difference between mercy and grace. Does that help you get a little bit better sense of what it means? How it works out in real life. Now let's go back to what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Here's the definition. A peacemaker is someone who brings opposing parties together. Someone who fosters an environment of harmony or unity. It also means that not only are you standing in the middle bringing people together, but it means you and someone else where there is a condition of hostility where you are the initiator in trying to restore that relationship. Both of those things are in play here. The opposite of this would be someone who's an agitator, an instigator, a warmonger. And we've seen a lot of this in our culture, haven't we? We have just come through a very bitter political season. We've come through times where people want to divide us based on our skin color, on our socioeconomic backgrounds, on, on you name it, our gender, everything. We're, they're trying to be an agitator and to create a wall of hostility. But a citizen of God's kingdom does not divide. There's somebody who brings people together. And that's the kind of person we need to be. These kinds of people are called sons or daughters of God. Now what does that mean, sons of God? Sons of God means a sameness of nature. That's what it literally means. And you've heard this expression before. Like father, like son, right? I mean, yep, that's just exactly what your dad would do. Okay? All right. When we're a peacemaker, we're like God, who is the chief peacemaker. There was hostility in our relationship with God. But who made the first move? God did. He brought us together. You see? He didn't have to do that. He provided a way to bring peace. Not only with him, but he brought peace between Jews and Gentiles together. He brought us together because we share something in common. So we become like him. You know, there are times when I say, that's my boy. Or my grandson, I'll say, that's my boy. And that means I'm proud of him. He's doing something that I would want to do. All right? We have a sameness of nature as does God when we choose to be a peacemaker. These are the things God has extended to us. Mercy and peace. And we're expected to be a conduit to channel those same blessings to other people. Now that's going to make us odd. That's going to make, it's going to make us stand out. Glory to God that it does. This should get people's attention. But it does bring people together. And that's what we want to see happen. Mercy is expected and peace is expected. Let's, let's think a little bit about this mercy. Here's a reference from Matthew 23, 23. Jesus is speaking to the, scribe, the scribes and Pharisees, and he says this. Woe to you! Ooh, that's what a prophet would say when he's pronouncing a curse on someone from God. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! A hypocrite is a term that comes from uh, the theater. A hypocrite was an actor who would put on, you've seen those masks before, you know, one smiling and one frowning. 
back in the, in the, in the day, actors would put on a mask to let you know what kind of a character they were playing. It's not the way they were behind the mask, but it's what they're, what they're actually portraying. Okay? That's what a hypocrite is. It's not a real person. You, you, you're, you're opposing yourself. You're a hypocrite. For, here's what they were doing. You, you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. What are they? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. These things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Mercy is a weightier matter of the law. <coughs> this is a serious thing that we need to be pursuing in our lives. Mercy ex is extended to us, and it's expected for us to extend to others. Take some time and, and look at... The, let's do it together. Let's, let's just go there. Take, take your Bibles out. Let's go to Matthew 18, and let's look at this together. Matthew 18. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. For those of you that are trying to figure out what in the world translation is he using? That's what I'm using. Okay. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me that I forgive him? As many as seven times? He was expecting. Atta boy, Peter! Seven times. Good for you. He didn't get it out of the way. No. No. I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him but owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment be made. So the servant filled those needs and ordered him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seized him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It is expected of us that we show mercy. <coughs> Extending mercy and making peace are two gifts that God has extended to us and we're expected to allow to flow through us to others. Consider these things about God's mercy. From Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. From Titus 3, 4 to 6. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And check this out too. Not just mercy, but also comfort. We're expected to give comfort 
to others as God has comforted us. From 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I'm going to say that fast. That'll tongue tie it real easy. In a very practical sense, let me just say this. Some of you have been through some horrible things in your life. And when you're going through it, it's horrible to go through it. And God gives you comfort. And have you not found that sometimes you come across somebody else that's gone through the very same thing? And you can say to them, I know exactly what you're going through. No, you don't. Oh, believe me. I do. Let me tell you my story. Wow. You have? Let me tell you what God did for me. Let me tell you how God gave me comfort so I can help you experience the comfort of God. Many times, I believe this, God takes us through trials so that we can identify with others and have a ministry in their lives. Now, none of us want to join up for that club. None of us want to take that class, do we? Oh, no, I don't want to take that course. No, thank you. And sometimes God says, you're going to take that course. It's required in your curriculum to take it. And not only are you going to see that I'm faithful to you and I'm comforting you, but you're going to be able to use that to comfort someone else. And that's how a lot of ministry takes place. So don't be surprised when you go through hard times because it makes you somebody who can minister to other people. And you can share testimony. Let me tell you how God got me through that. Pass that comfort along to those who are suffering. Now in terms of peacemaking, look what it says in Colossians 1, 19-20. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. From Ephesians 2, 14 to 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. God is a peacemaker in our life as well. We have a responsibility to be peacemakers. Here are some references that just talk about peace with others in general. We are to live at peace with others. Peace between God and man. We are to help people to be reconciled. You are here because somebody took the time to help you become at peace with God. And you and I should do the same thing. We are to live peaceable lives under government leaders through prayer. We're to pray for our leaders that we may live a life of peace and godliness. Peace is a life pursuit stemming from a pure heart. And peaceability is proof that we have wisdom from above. You see how important peace is? Peace in our own lives and us being peacemakers with others. We need to strive for these two things. They're so important. We have received them ourselves and we pass these along to others. So, where does this bring us? I want to give you some ideas here of how we can put this into practice. All right? First of all, you can go back and review 
all these references that are on this sheet. And those of you that are watching online, you can download this. It's in a PDF format from the website. And you can see this very same sheet that all these folks have as well. Did any, let me just ask you this. Did any of you go back this last week and look at any of the references? Would you just raise your hand so I can put a star by your name in my grade book? <laughs> oh, thank you, Jim. I see that hand. <laughs> All right, I see some of this. I see some of this. That was me in math class, by the way. Good. Do that. I, I, I want to give you such thorough notes that you can go back during the week and you can, you can process this. Consider this part one, and then your homework is to go home and to go back and look over this. And let God continue to work this through you as you meditate on these things. Ask yourself this question. To what extent do you really appreciate the mercy God has extended to you? How does it motivate your response? Your response in living a life of holiness? I firmly believe that if we truly appreciate, we're going to find that we're going to have an easier time saying no to temptation. If we truly appreciate what God's given to us and what it cost Him, it's going to affect our hearts. And it will give us victory over temptation in giving in to temptation. But it will motivate us in our relationships with others. Meditate on the peace that God has made with you and extends to you, continues to extend to you. And then ask yourself, this is an important question, with whom do you need to seek peace in terms of a relationship that is not right. Maybe he's already been doing that. He's been poking you in the chest, saying, you need to make something like that person. You've been putting it off. There is a division, and you need to make it right. You need to forgive as God has forgiven. I did that this week. I called somebody that, that I had, had potentially done something very wrong with. And I apologized. And I said, I am sorry if I came across this way. I, I, I should have done it. Will you please forgive me? Will you be merciful to me? I have to preach on this this week. Will you, will you <laughs> extend mercy to me? <laughs> And this person said, absolutely, absolutely. Right? And, and, I, and I expressed to this person, this is important to me because I want there to be peace in our relationship. I don't want there to be any, any wall between us. So I want to make sure that we're okay. Are, are we okay? Is there any, anything else I need to apologize? No, no, believe me, no. I, I just want to be sure. That's a practical application, folks, that we need to do. Some of us have been walking around for years with unforgiveness in our hearts. And we just need to clear things up. Now, God's Word does say, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Sometimes people won't let you be at peace with them. You know what I'm saying? You've tried, and they, and they say, no, no, no. At least you need to make the effort to try and live at peace with others. So when we extend mercy, when we seek to extend peace to people, we are showing that we are citizens of God's kingdom. Don't be surprised if somebody said, you know, why are you doing this? Because, because it's important that you understand I'm not perfect, and, 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 I, and I value our relationship. And I, and I want you to understand that. And they may even say, well, it's such a little thing. Oh, you may think it's little, but you know what? 
God has forgiven me for so much. Oh my goodness, so much. Really? Tell me about it. There you go. You may have an opportunity to share Christ or share your testimony with someone just by taking steps by to extend mercy and to seek peace. This is profound. Our Christian faith is more than a set of doctrines. It's a changed life. It's being a better person than we were before. Old things passed away. New things have come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Live as a new creature in Christ. We don't have to live the way we did before. <clears throat> Here's our kingdom practice for the week. Kingdom citizens extend to others all the blessings that they have freely received from God themselves. Let's read that together. Okay, here we go. Kingdom citizens extend to others all blessings they have freely received from God themselves. Now what I'd like for us to do is I've intentionally left Time for us to talk about this. And so, I want us to talk the walk. I want to hear from you. We need to hear from each other. How do we put this in practice? So I want you to consider this. What are tangible examples of how we should show mercy and peace to fellow believers and unbelievers. I want us to have a lot of examples so that we can understand how do we process this. So I'm going to give you a chance to speak into this question. All right? But I want to give you some guidelines. This comes from Gary. I thought this was pretty clever. A, B, C. A, be audible. Make sure we can hear you. All right? So speak loudly enough so that we can hear each other. B, be brief. All right? When you have an opportunity to be up here doing this, you can talk all you want. But in sharing, let's be brief enough that we can allow others an opportunity to share. And C, let's stay focused on Christ and what he commands us to do. Okay? When we won't, don't want to bash anybody. We want to stay focused on that. So A, B, C. All right? And this means... Be brief. If you see me go like this, okay, be brief. Okay. I want us to talk about this, and then I'll close this in prayer, and then Jeff will come back up. So, who wants to be the first one to share that? Hey, go ahead. How we conduct ourselves when we're driving. Oh! <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, yes. Oh, how we drive. Oh, I didn't even think about that. That is so good. Yeah, if you're going to drive like a maniac, by the way, would you take that fish off the back of your car? <laughs> oh, my. Take your bumper stickers off. Please don't do that. Yeah. You know, do, do only the crazy people uh, get in front of you at the same time? Listen, i got to be honest. There are times that I've been that crazy person. I, I pull out in front of somebody, and I think, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one. All right, what, what's another? Okay, Jeff? I saw a movie recently that I thought was a great example of this. It's called Unbroken. Uh, mm. Louis, uh, what's his last name? Right. Yes. Yeah. He was a, a World War II vet. He was in the Pacific Theater, mm -hmm. and he was tortured unmercifully by the Japanese. And make a long story short, he came home. He lived in Los Angeles for a while. He got saved under the Holy Grail. Crusades, right. and later on in life, he went back and he reached out to the tormentors. Some of them became Christians because of his yes. telling them that he had forgiven them. But the one guy, the, the meanest one, oh. he would not have anything to he do wouldn't. with it. But that just, that's what yeah. you said earlier. Some people they won't. will never uh, meet you halfway. Yes. Uh, that's great. 
That is a great movie. I've seen that. I read the book. Really, really good example. Yeah. Good. Others? Yeah. Well, I have two. One, um, I have a brother that's uh, estranged from me. Uh, and uh, he, he was a Christian, walked away from the Lord, reached out to him several times, once through Facebook, once through an email, never heard anything. But I know before God, I offered him forgiveness, and that's great. A tangible example, I am now retired, so I feel I can freely say this, but I used to work in an office with many women. And oh, I'm if you're really honest, <laughs> yes, I, 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 I didn't always. I used to walk work with just men, and I've been in office all by myself and preferred men. But the last couple of years, I had worked with a group of women. And if you've ever worked in any office situation, regardless, there's going to sometimes be gossip or unkind words. Mm. So I had heard and read about forgiveness. Um, been a Christian for many years, and I thought, I've got to do something real and practical about this. I have to put something to my belief of I need to ask their forgiveness, mostly for what I had thought, not even just what I had said. Mm -hmm. And um, so I sweetened the deal. I made some little cupcakes. I took it to each one of those ladies in the office, and I said, I need you to forgive me for the unkind things I have thought or have said. And I would say the majority of them would have said they were Christian too. And they almost without fail said, we don't know why you're doing this. Mm. You, you, you haven't offended us. I said, I didn't say I offended you. I said, I know in my heart I have been unkind. And so uh, it's, it, you know, whatever the Lord lays on your heart, act upon it. Good. That's good. All right. That's good. Someone else. What are some other things that we can do? Okay. Standing in line at the store when the person checking out in front of you has a whole litany for one item that they bought, telling the cashier things that who cares? <laughs> <laughs> and the poor cashier started the day number one just came into work, had worked cashier before. The person turned around and said to me, I'm sorry for taking so long, but I wanted to get this right. Mm -hmm. And apparently have had problems in the past, didn't know about them here. Uh, my answer was, it's okay with me, you know. Uh, what am I going to do? There's only one cashier. i got to wait for you. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> but at the end of the whole thing, I thought to myself, I came in here to get one item and one item only. Number one, I couldn't find the item. Number two, they were out of it. Number three, they had a kit that contained the item I wanted. It was a little more expensive. So I had it. Okay. And then shopping around, I found several other things that I wanted, but I didn't know about. So I had to put them in the cart too. So, you know, waiting in line is, is a big one. You've got more than 10 items in your cart. <laughs> you only had one. Be merciful. Be merciful. Okay, good. Someone else. Jan. Oh, Jan. Um, do FaceTime with John's mom once or twice a week and um, it's a very it's a really big challenge because she has so much difficulty hearing so we need to be merciful because often she doesn't hear it we have to repeat we'll set up a time and she'll forget about it you know and then she's not there and, and so um, this reminded me of being merciful to her and, and peace making sure that relationship that we're not offended that she's not offended and uh, she's so gracious about it that um, it makes it easier. But it's still, you know, it's still hard to keep communicating and keep working at it, and you know, not hearing. So then you hold up the paper so she can read it, and you know, whatever, whatever it takes. But to, to show mercy to her in that situation. Good, good. Some other things. How about peacemaking? 
what are some ideas that you might have about how we can either bring people together or help people in their vertical? Horizontal and vertical. What are your thoughts about that? Try to find some common interest. <coughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Shut up about the president. <laughs> 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 he gonna do what he gonna do anyway. Okay. All right. Pray for him. Pray for him. All right. Okay. I find myself sometimes, well, often, get impatient, and it shows in my voice, especially on the telephone, when somebody has not completed a task as it should have been, or uh, not done what I asked, or something. So, I find myself, and I, I have to go to God for forgiveness, but I find myself being impatient and, you know, curt or, or mm -hmm. uh, short in my answers. And that's something that, you know, that I'm not showing mercy. Mm -hmm. I'm not showing compassion. Sure. So, good. Someone else? Yeah. Well, I, I teach um, teenagers quite often um, in the public schools, so and I'm subbing, so I'm in different rooms um, a lot. And um, boys can tend to um, want to just touch each other, punch each other, kick, mm -hmm. or whatever. And I don't, and a lot of times they just start out just kind of being kidding around, um, but I'll try and stop it right at the beginning. If I see any type of, um, just any type of uh, rough housing at all, even if they say shut up to one another, I'll say, let's, let's say please be quiet. Um, so I'm, I try to just diffuse anything that's gonna start. And sometimes they'll say, oh, Mrs. G, we were just kidding around. And I'm like, you know, I, I get that, but I just want to make sure it doesn't get any further <laughs> or get out of hand like that. Sure. So, so that's kind of a way. I, when, when I think of peace, sure. peace making, <laughs> I try to do that with teenagers. Yeah, I think teachers do a lot of peacemaking between students. I mean, I know I, I would have to do that when I was teaching. Uh, yeah. 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 I think if we just when we're put in situations, if we, if we can just be conscious enough to take a step back. And you know, one of the things I always talk about, especially with my kids, is um, just try to be an effective listener and, and capture those little nuggets mm -hmm. that um, uh, you know that you can you can pick up and then proceed accordingly. Um, you know, I've had that. I've had that several times and um, I got a situation this past week where my daughter now who's driven maybe a year has locked her keys in her car three times <laughs> and she uh, she was in the house so Donnie went up to help her out and she was already in the house when I walked in and her first reaction to me was I didn't say a word you know yeah. and she was like I, I was stressed. I was uh, uh, uh. It's okay. Don't worry. You know. But you know, I I wanted to lose my temper. Mm -hmm. But you know, in my thought process, I was like, it's just that's not going to solve anything. That's not going to help the situation. The best thing I can do is <coughs> just keep my mouth shut. Understand that it was an accident in the grand scheme of things, and move on accordingly. Okay. Yeah. Humor is a great diffuser. Stressful, tense mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. You know. It can be a great diffuser. I found that, especially like with my children, at different times when we were in tense relationships. And, um, so that 
that's a useful tool. Good. Use. Humor as a diffuser, yeah. Good. Have you noticed that when you uh, when you go through a checkout line, you know the uh, the person working the cash register looks kind of frazzled. You know how do you treat how do you treat people like that? You know, um, you know how are you today? You know, they always ask you, did you find everything you're looking for? You know, <laughs> and and they'll and they'll say, how are you today? But do you ever say, have you had a good day today? Have you? Are you starting your shift or are you towards the end of your shift? You know, little comments like that can bring peace to people that are in the service industries. Um, I see heads nodding. Yeah, it does. Those are good things. It doesn't take that much just to say a little thing. That's not the way I am. Well, I tend not to be as much that way either. I have a friend who's very much that way. Uh, his name is Warren. And I think, you know, WWWD, what would Warren do? Um, he would end up sharing the gospel with somebody as he's going through it. I mean, he's just, he's a very high I personality type, and, he, and he's got the gift of evangelism. And, you know, I'm thinking, what would Warren do in a situation like this? You know, he would, he would give a blessing to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I have another equipment that I just thought I'd share my memory. Uh, we have... Our company was, was just about 600 people that produced the OEM electronics for, for, for boats. And we had about 25 people that deal with hundreds of thousands of customers that bought our products over the years uh, in customer service. Mm. That is a job that <laughs> I do not, wouldn't wish oh, yeah. on. And uh, those people go through unbelievable stress. So when we're dealing with them, usually it is something that we've been wrong or it's a defective product or whatever, but that's all they hear all day. And they, I've heard recording as training inside our company. We all have to take rotations there for a day, every couple of years. It's awful. <laughs> and so, and so oh, if you're talking to somebody in customer service, even here or in India or wherever. This is a great place to practice, and I'm pointing to me too. Okay. I, I can't stand it, but oh man, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Sure. That's a good opportunity. Okay, Kevin? Step away from the microphone. Um, keep it, uh, kind of dovetails off of Kevin, so towards his daughter, but keeping uh, your own anger towards yourself in check or just to your situation, because we like to think we're compartmentalized that if I'm dealing with work, it doesn't affect Christy or you or mm -hmm. anybody else, but you can, you know, you got the, you got a cup and your cup can run over, not in a good way. And uh, I get very angry with, not very angry, but stupidity sometimes that I'm dealing with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like customer service or something like that, you're dealing, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm one of those calls, no. Um, <laughs> but you know, it just, just maybe telling yourself to stay calm because not only can you set an example if others are seeing you when you stub your toe or you do something, but uh, if you get yourself too worked up, then the next thing that somebody says to you could create a lack of peace. Sure. With a reaction that you didn't mean to have, and you have to apologize for later after the damage is done. So there you go. So let me summarize. So let's let's watch for in our relationship with others. When others wrong us, and we have an opportunity to punish them. Let's show mercy to them as God has shown mercy to us. Let us be the kind of people who bring others together with each other, with us, with God. Let us stand out in those two ways. Since God extends these blessings to us, we need to extend them to others. So this week, let's really focus in on that. Let's, let's look at our interactions with other people and consider how we might show mercy and, and how we can interject peace into situations.
Now, don't be surprised if God gives you some exams this week. <laughs> don't be surprised if he, he gives you a pop quiz and well, maybe the Holy Spirit will say, I remember the sermon on Sunday. God does that many times. So this is the coursework, and then there's a quiz that follows. You can expect that. So, all right, let me pray. Lord, there is no way that we can adequately thank you for all of the blessings that you pour out on us continuously that you have in the past, and you continue to pour out on us. Your mercies are new every day. If this is one way, Lord, that we can express that, that appreciation by showing it to others, please change us from the inside that we would be better representatives of your kingdom, that we would stand apart from those around us that just respond in a worldly way. May we be people who are full of mercy and people who are peacemakers. And may that light that we shine into relationships bring glory to you. May others see that goodness in us and, and even provide us with opportunities to share the hope that is within us with others. Thank you for doing this for us. We commit ourselves to you as your kingdom citizens this week. Amen.